the future space habitats are one of intelligent structures, maybe not all the way to how, and the, you know, 2001 Space Odyssey reference that scares people about the habitat having a mind of its own. But certainly we're building systems now where the habitat has sensing technology that allows it to communicate its basic functions, you know, maintaining life support for the astronauts, but could also communicate in symbiosis with these swarm robots that would be on the outside of the spacecraft, uh, whether it's in a microgravity orbiting environment or on the surface. And these little robots, they crawl, just a la Neil Stephenson and Seven Eves, they crawl along the outside of the spacecraft looking for micrometeorite punctures or gas leaks or other faults and uh, defects. And right now, we're just working on the diagnosis. So can the swarm, with its collective intelligence, act in symbiosis with the spacecraft and detect things? But in the future, we'd also love for these little micro-robots to repair in situ and really be like ants living in a tree altogether connected to the spacecraft. Do you envision uh, the system to be fully distributed and just like an ant colony if one of them uh, is damaged or, you know, whatever, uh, loses control and all those kinds of things that that, that doesn't affect the performance of the, the, the complete system or d- does it need to be centralized? This is more like almost like a technical question. Do you think we Good can- Good architecture f- question. Right, it, from the ground up, it's, it's so scary to go fully distributed. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but it's also exceptionally powerful, right? Robust, resilient to right. the harsh conditions of space. Where do you, um, if you look into the next 10, 20, 100 years, um, starting from scratch, do you think we should be doing architecture-wise distributed systems? For space, yes, because it gives you this redundancy and safety profile that's really critical. So whether it's small swarm robots where it doesn't matter if you lose a few of them, to habitats that instead of having a central monolithic habitat, you might actually be able to have a decentralized node of a space station uh, so that you can kind of write out of Star Wars. You can shut a blast door if there's a fire or if there's a conflict in a certain area and you can move the humans and the crew into another decentralized node of the spacecraft. There's another idea out of Neil Stevenson, Seven Eves, actually, were these arclets, uh, which were decentralized spacecraft that could form and dock little temporary space stations with each other and then separate and go off on their way and, and have a decentralized approach to living in space. So the self-assembly component of that, too. So this is your PhD work and beyond. You explored autonomously self-assembling space architecture for future space tourist habitats and space stations in orbit around Earth, Moon, and Mars. There, there's few things I personally find uh, sexier than self-assembling space arch- autonomously self-assembling s- space architecture. In general, it doesn't even need to be space. The idea of like, self-assembling architectures is really interesting, like building a bridge or something like that right. through self-assembling materials. It feels like an incredibly efficient way to do it because optimization is built in. So you can build like the most optimal structures given dynamic, uncertain, changing conditions. Mm-hmm. So uh, maybe can you talk about your PhD work, about this this work about uh, Tesserae, what is it in general? All sure. the, any, any cool stuff, because this is super <laughs> cool. <too. laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. So Tesserae is my PhD research. It's this idea that we could take tiles that construct a large is structure like a is? buckyball. Yeah, this is exactly what we're looking at here, which is the tiles that are packed flat in a rocket. They're released to float in microgravity. Magnets, pretty powerful electro-permanent magnets on their edges, draw them together for autonomous docking. So there's no human in the loop here, and there's no central agent coordinating, saying tile one, go to tile two. It's a completely decentralized system. They find each other on their own. (laughs) What we don't show in this video is what happens if there's an error right? So what happens if they bond incorrectly? The tiles have sensing, so proximity sensing, magnetometer, other sensors that allow them to detect a good bond versus a bad bond and pulse off and self-correct, which anybody who works in this, you know, the field of self-assembly will tell you that error detection and correction, just like uh, error detection in a DNA sequence or protein folding, Mm -hmm. is really important part of the system for that robustness. And so we've done a lot of work to engineer that ability for the tiles to be self-determining 
they know whether they're forming the structure that they're supposed to form or not. They know if they're in a toxic relationship and they need <laughs> to get out. Right, right. If they need, <laughs> this, to, if they need to separate, exactly. Yeah. All right. This is like so amazing, and for people who are just listening to this, yeah, there's a lot. I mean, how large are these tiles? So the size that we use in the lab, they can really be any size because right. we can scale them down to do testing and microgravity. So we sent tiles that were about three inches wide to the International Space Station a couple years ago to test the code, test the state machine, test the algorithm of self-assembly. But now we're actually building our first ever human scale tiles. They're me human size, so a little, you know, a little smaller than maybe your average human. Um, but they're uh, 2.5 feet on edge length. The larger scale that we would love to build in the future would actually be tiles that are big enough to form a buckyball, big open spherical volume, spherical approximation volume, that'd be about 10 meters in diameter, so 30 feet, which is much bigger and grander in terms of open space than any current module on the ISS. And one of the goals of this project was to say, what's the purpose? of next generation space architecture. Should it be something that really inspires and delights people when you float into that space? Can you get goosebumps in the way that you do when you walk into a really stunning piece of architecture on Earth? And so we think that self-assembly, this modular reconfigurable algorithm for constructing space structures in orbit is going to give us this promise of space architecture that's actually worth living in. Living in, oh, oh, I thought you also meant from like outside artistic perspective, when yeah. you see the whole thing is just. With the aesthetics of it, absolutely. You know, when you like go like in, into Vegas, or something, whenever <laughs> you go into a city and it like over the hill appears in front of you. And I mean, there's something majestic about uh, seeing like, wow, humans created that. It gives you like hope about like yes. if these a bunch of ants were able to figure out how to build sky skyscrapers that light up and in general the design of these tiles in the way you envision it are right. pretty scalable. Yes. And they're inspired by exactly what you mentioned a moment ago, which is we have these patterns of self-assembly on Earth. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of fantastic MIT research that we're building this concept on. So like Daniela Roos at Seasail and Pebbles taking the power of magnets to create units that are themselves interchangeable, this notion of programmable matter. And so we're interested in going really big with it to build big scale space structures with programmable tiles. But there's also a really fascinating, you know, end of that on the other side of the spectrum, which is how small can you go with matter that's programmable and stacks and builds itself and creates a bridge or something in the future. What do you envision the thing would look like like when you imagine a thing far into the future where there's um so we're not even thinking about like uh small space well let's not call them small but <laughs> our currently sized space stations but like something gigantic what do you envision is this something with symmetry or is this something we can't even come up with yet is, is it is, is there beautiful structures that you imagine in your mind I've got three candidates that I would love to build. If we're talking about monumental space architecture, one is, what does a space cathedral look like? It can be a secular cathedral. It doesn't necessarily have to be about religion, but that notion of long sight lines, inspiring, stunning architecture when you go in. And you can imagine floating, instead of you know being on the ground and only looking up, in space, you could be in a central node and each direction you look at, all the cardinal directions, are spires going off in a really large and long way. So that's concept number one. Number two would be something more organic that's not just geometric. So here, one of the ideas that we're working on at MIT in my lab is to say, could you, instead of the tesserae model, right, which is self-assembling a shell, could you define a module that's a node, a small node that someone can live in, and you self-assemble a lot of those together? They're called uh, plesiohedrons, like uh, space-filling solids. And you dock a bunch of them together, and you can create a really organic structure out of that. So this is uh, the same way that muscles accrete to appear. You can have these nodes that dock together. And one shape that I would love to form out of this is something like a nautilus, a seashell that beautiful you know, Fibonacci spiral sequence that you get uh, in that shape, which I think would be a stunning and fabulous um, aggregated space station. You said so many cool words, Ple plesiohedron. Yeah, plesiohedron. So that, that's a space filling. Solid. The simplest and, thing to think of is like a cube. Sphere? Oh, cube. A cube, right? So you can stack cubes together, and if you had an infinite number of cubes, you'd fill 
all that space. There's no gaps in between the cubes. They stack and fill space. Uh, another plesiohedron is a truncated octahedron. And that's actually one of the candidate structures that we think would be great for space stations. What's the truncated part? Ah, oh. so it you cut off a, an octahedron actually has like little pointy areas. Right. You truncate certain sections of it and you get um, surfaces that are on the structure that are cubes and I think hexagons. I'd have to remind myself mm -hmm. exactly what the faces are. But overall, a truncated octahedron can be bonded to other truncated octahedrons. And just like a cube, it fills all the gaps as you build it out. So you can imagine two truncated octahedrons, they come together at an airlock, which is what we space people call doors in space. Mm -hmm. And you dock them on all sides and you've basically created this decentralized network of space nodes that make a big space station. And once you have enough of them, and you're growing with enough big units, you can do it in any macro shape you want. That's where the Nautilus comes in, is could we design an organically inspired shape for a space station? Can I just say how awesome it is to hear you say, we space people. I know you <laughs> meant people that are doing research on space exploration, space technology, but it also made me think of a future. There's Earth people, mm. <laughs> and, there's, and there's those space people, and then I'd there's the Mars people. I'd love to unite those two. Yeah, no, no, for sure, <laughs> for sure. But like, it's like New Yorkers and mm. like uh, Texans or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course, you, you you live for a time in New York, and then you go up to Boston, and but for a time, you're the space people. Mm -hmm. Oh, I know those space people. They're, they're kind of <laughs> wild up there. Let's see how that dynamic evolves. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. There's that culture. Culture forms, and I, I would love to see what kind of culture once you once you have sort of more and more civilians. I mean, there's a human. I mean, I love psychology and sociology, and and I'll maybe ask you about that too, which is like the dynamic between humans. You have mm -hmm. to kind of start considering that yeah. when you start spending more and more time up in space and and start sending civilians, start sending bigger and bigger groups of people. And then of course, the, the beautiful and the ugly emerges from the uh, from the human nature that we haven't been able to escape up to this point. Uh, but when you say the plesiohedrons, these kinds of shapes, are they multifunctional? Like, can you, is the idea you'd be able to, uh, uh, humans can occupy them safely in some of them and some others have some other purposes? Exactly. One could be sleeping quarters. One could be a greenhouse or an agricultural unit. One could be a storage depot. Mm -hmm. Essentially, all of the different rooms or functions that you might need in a space station could be subdivided into these nodes and then stacked together. And one of the promises of both Tesserae, my original PhD research, which is these shells, and then this follow-on node concept, is that right now we build space stations, and once they're built, they're done. You can't really change them profoundly. But the benefit of a modular self-assembling system is you can disassemble it. You can completely reconfigure it. Uh, so if your mission changes or the number of people in space that you want to host, if you have a space conference happening like South by Southwest. I was thinking space party, but space, space conference party. is good too. <laughs> sure. Then uh, maybe all of a sudden you want to change out what were window tiles yesterday, cupola tiles, and make them into a birthing port so that you can welcome five new spaceships to come and join you in space. That's what this promise of reconfigurable space architecture might allow us to explore. I've been hanging out with Grimes recently. I just feel like she belongs up in space. <laughs> this is like designed for for artists, essentially. I like imagine, I mean, this is what South By int keeps introducing me to is there's like the weird and the beautiful people and like the artists. And yeah. th it feels like there's a lot of opportunities for art and design. 100%. It's like, it's like space is a combination of art, design, and, and great engineering yeah. with, with a... a it's uh, safety critical with like the highest of stakes. So don't, you can't, you can't mess it up. And is this, is there, first of all, you talking about tiling. So Neil Stevenson is obsessed about tiling. I don't know if it's related to any of this, but he seems to be obsessed with like, how do you tile a space? That's like a math yeah. geometric notion, like yeah. the tessellation. And it's, I mean, it's a beautiful idea for architecture that you can self-assemble these different shapes and you can have probably some centralized guidance of the kind of thing you want to build, but they also kind of figure stuff out themselves in terms of yeah. the low level details, in terms of the figuring out when the when if everything fits just right uh, for the OCD people. Like, <laughs> yeah. uh, what's that subreddit? Uh, pleasantly, 
It's like really fun. Everything, they have like videos of everything is just pleasant when everything just fits perfectly. Very pleasing. Yeah, All the pleasing. tolerances come together well. Yeah. <laughs> so they figure that out on themselves <laughs> and, and the local robotics problem. Exactly. But by the way, was Daniel Rose Pebbles, was the Pebbles yeah. Project? The Pebbles Project are little cubes that have EPMs in them, electropermanent magnets, and they can self disassemble. So they'll turn off. And so you'll have this little structure that all of a sudden can uh, flip the little uh, pebbles over and um, essentially just disaggregate. They have to make some pleasing sounds. Right? Yes. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. And we have to, well, that's going to, so I'm supposed to talk to Danielle. So I'll d probably spend an hour just discussing the sounds on the pebbles. <laughs> okay. Uh, what were we talking about? So the, so that's because you mentioned two, I think. Right. My third one. Yeah. What, is there a third one? My third one is a ring world, just because <laughs> every science fiction book ever that's worth anything has a ring world in it. And uh, is this is like a donut. Or? A donut. Yeah. yeah. So a really big torus that could encircle a planet uh, or encircle another celestial body, maybe an uh, asteroid or a small moon. And um, the promise here is just the, the beauty of being able to have that geometry in orbit and all that surface area for solar panels and docking and um, essentially just all of what that enables to have a ring world at that scale in orbit. Would well, be by the way, for the viewers, we're looking at figure 11. What paper is this from? This is a uh, hexagonal tiling of a torus generated in, in Mathematica, referencing code and approach from two citations. So yeah. we're looking at a tiled donut, and exactly. I'm now hungry. So this is the, <laughs> is this is this from your thesis or no? Uh, this is probably, I mean, this is in my thesis. This looks like it was one of my earlier papers. This was an approach to say, great, we've come up with this tessellation approach for a buckyball. And we picked the buckyball because it is the most efficient surface area to volume shape and what's expensive in space, the surface area, shipping up all that material. So we wanted something that would maximize the volume. But if we think about ring worlds and other shapes, we wanted to look at how do you tile a torus, and this is one example with hexagons, to be able to say, could we take this same tesserae approach of self-assembling tiles and create other geometries. This is so freaking cool. This is awesome.